Uh, I'd like first to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here, getting a little bit of the warm uh, winter in Brazil, right? And uh, as I know from Natal, it's the same in summer and winter, so it doesn't change. Uh, I'm also very glad to close the Cuprate session with a Nick Tide's talk. So uh, it's still a superconductor, but there is a little bit of a different physics, and I changed some of the subjects so that we don't add to the mass of the cuprates already. So this is mostly of the work of two former grad students, Bingxing Chu and Yao Ming Dai. Uh, Yao Ming uh, Bingxing is now in Fribourg, working with Christian Bernard, and Yao Ming, he went to Los Alamos for a while, and he has his own lab in Nanjing now. So they, they are former very very hard competitors for what I do because they work much faster than what I can do. But there are also uh, collaboration with Tom Timusk, uh, Chris Holmes, samples came from China and also from CA Saclay, and there's some low data from Tallinn. So this is a very long collaboration here. Uh, so uh, the first, what did I just do here? I have no idea, but it's working, right? The resolution is a little bit strange. So I'd like to make a small introduction about the baron arsenide nictide series, okay, because you haven't seen it too much. The optical conductivity, and just a very brief introduction on the optical conductivity, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, show what the multiband effects that we have in the nictides affect the measurements that we do. And uh, here I had pseudo-gap physics, and because it's not the same pseudo-gap as the cuprates, I took it off and put Dirac physics. But Dirac physics is probably also wrong from the talk we heard this morning. So maybe it's biophysics. I have no idea. But it's, it's conic physics, let's say. like. And then I would like to discuss in-plane and out-of-plane doping and uh, what happens with the superconducting gap in the system. Okay? So uh, the first thing is the rough properties of the, the barium-122 family. And uh, we start with a phase diagram, which is very similar to the cuprate. It has nothing to do phase diagram. First of all, we don't start with an insulating phase. This is not really work. Well, let's see. Uh, we start with a metallic or at least conducting phase, the unmapped phase. It has an antiferromagnetic order. It has a structural phase transition very close to that antiferromagnetic order. You do have a superconducting dome, which is divided here inside with this antiferromagnetic order. Uh, the physics of the system is essentially governed by R and arsenide planes. So it's a bidimensional physics, and everything's interesting is happening here. Though you can get superconductivity by doping on any site. You can dope on the barium site uh, with potassium. You can go up on the, dope on the iron site with cobalt, for instance, or on the arsenide site with phosphorus. And all of them are superconducting, doping with holes, with electrons, or with nothing at all, putting phosphorus in the, in the uh, arsenide site doesn't change the doping. It's just a pressure effect. And uh, the superconductivity is dominated by the, this iron arsenide planes. Then you have five bands at the Fermi surface. So you have a multi-band superconductor essentially divided up to, into two sets, one at uh, one uh, uh, electron-like here and a holo-like here uh, with multiple bands inside. Um, so to describe this, I use optical conductivity. That's what I measure. Optical conductivity is electrical conductivity at optical frequencies, from the infrared all the way to the ultraviolet. So it's how the sample would conduct electricity if we apply the current at that frequency to the sample. Okay? I will not enter into the detail on to get that, but essentially you shine light, measure the reflected light, and calculate the optical conductivity from that. And this is for a metallic sample or for a conducting sample, is in the first approach described by the Druda model, which is essentially just a free electron gas introduced by Paul Druda in the 1900s. And what you have in an infrared spectrum, if there's only one message about infrared you can get from this talk, is this one. If you look at an infrared conductivity and you see a peak at zero frequency, it's a metallic peak. If you see a peak at a finite frequency, it's a bound charge. If you say that in a party around a glass of champagne, people will find you very smart. That's all you need to know about infrared. Zero frequency conducting, not zero frequency. It's a bound charge. And uh, the Druda model is a very easy way to describe that because infrared being an electrical measurement, its zero frequency extension is 
sigma naught is sigma dc, it's the conductivity, the electrical conductivity of the sample, and you can get directly from the measurement the scattering rate. It's the, it's the width at half maximum. Okay? Now how does this work in a multiband material? And this has been done for almost any nictide series here, and essentially in every sample that people tried to apply the Druda model, you have conductivity as a function of frequency, so a thousand uh, wave numbers is about 100 millivolts, a little more, 120 millivolts. So you have frequency here, optical conductivity here for a whole bunch of series uh, of samples, and essentially what you need to put is two Druda peaks. Conductivity is an addition of two uh, quantities. You put two Druda peaks and you fit your data. Okay, it's a phenomenological fitting. Now you have a problem. You have five bands and you have two peaks. So this is one of the features or the drawbacks of the infrared technique is that you're averaging over the Fermi surface. So why do only two peaks work? And there's a really very useful uh, or very convincing explanation for that. The best we can do is to try to compare this with more direct measurements. So these are uh, um, quantum oscillations. I don't know if it's Das van Alphen or Shubnikov Das, but it's one of these. And uh, you can get the scattering rate from different bands here. And they sort of few in groups. They, they bunch, in one around four and one around eight. And you can say I'm averaging all uh, the, the, the electron-like and all the whole-like thing uh, in the same pack. Okay, so that's the idea of the two Druda peaks. All, all of these with the, the, the Fermi surface at the zone center have a smaller uh, scattering, uh, scattering time than the ones at the, the electron-like at the border of the zone. Okay, so you say this is one Druda, this is the other, and it sort of works like that. The numbers are not very far off, okay, a factor two. So does this give you any meaningful information? And this is one of the first problems that were solved by the infrared technique is that you have the optic, uh, the, the resistivity here and it has this bending down here before the superconducting transition as a function of temperature and coming from cube rates people jump to the roof and there is a pseudo gap here and there are preformed pairs and there is this and that and this is fascinating, it's the same physics, it's not. Okay, so the first, uh, you can write a PRL to say that things are simple every now and then. And the issue here is that you take the optical conductivity, you fit it with the two Druda peaks. And then you look at what you have in, the, in those two Druda peaks. So this is the whole optical conductivity all the way to 1.2 eV. The Druda part is this. There's a large bound interband transition here. That doesn't matter. But here are the two Druda peaks, as everybody else does. And you follow that those two Druda peaks as a function of temperature and the scattering rate you have. You have one which is very linear, constant scattering rate, totally independent of frequency, just a linear scattering rate with temperature and when it's flat. And if now you put in numbers and look not only at the scattering rate but also at the charge density and calculate the, op uh, the, the resistivity coming from these two bands, you see there is a crossover here. And this crossover is exactly at the same location there's this bending here. So this is not a pseudo gap. You just have whatever happens when you have two bands competing for the charge and for the transport in the system. So uh, by using this true through the peaks, you just see that you have a crossover and that crossover is responsible for the weird DC properties that you have in nick times. So here it's what I would talk about pseudo gap, but I will not because it's not the same pseudo gap. So I'll put something even more controversial, which is the Dirac cones in the system because uh, you have a spin density wave transition, the antiferromagnetic transition here. And uh, it's very easily seen in the spectrum. This is reflectivity. You see a large jump drop here. This is calcium, iron, arsenide with fluoride. If you calculate the optical conductivity, you see a lot of spectral weight that's lost here, that's gained here. This is the typical density wave gap behavior in infrared. You lose low frequency spectral weight, you gain high frequency spectral weight, the gap is around here. Okay. It's close to the minimum, maybe a little bit higher. It's model dependent. So now in this particular material, spin density wave interacts strongly with the structure and you have backfolding uh, of the bands. So uh, there has been there a couple of papers, this is, this is the most complete one, that says that this spin density wave induces backfolding of the brillouin zone and you have Dirac cones which are topologically protected. 
they, they, they go really a long way to do that. And then when you do double drew the feeding, uh, feeding and subtract the drew the model. So in, in the first Nictide series to see the linear res uh, resistivity, I look at the drew the peaks that I put in. Now what I do here, I fit with the drew the peaks, and now I don't want to look at them. I just take them off. And what remains on the back is this linear conductivity here followed by a linear conductivity here. And this, there's a large bunch of literature that says when you have a linear conductivity, you have three-dimensional Dirac cones in most of the cases. There are exceptions. So if you do the other way around, you can find this Dirac physics here. But the prediction goes beyond that. It says that that backfolding only happens in particular situations. Okay? And they predict that you should have this barium arsenide with the rack cones. And the idea is that when you are with your Fermi level between the hole and the electron bands, the, the maximum of the electron band and, uh, and the saddle point of the whole band, that's where you can have the backfolding and topologically protected uh, states. So above this point you don't, below this point you don't. Now if you look at these three samples, which you have cobalt doping, potassium doping, and undoped samples, you see that in the undoped sample, the black one here, you have a very similar, there's some bending here, but that's subtraction problems. The black curve has very sharp bends, like the one in calcium uh, fluoride nictide. And when you go above and below, those sharp bands begin to vanish, and they go away. So you have a region here that you can tune and find, if this is real, the Dirac physics uh, on those systems. So you can play uh, with the doping in the system and find uh, Dirac cones uh, in the nictite. Okay, so uh, let me move into the superconducting state, which we have some funny business here. Uh, first of all, if we start from the original BCS gap, so you have a self-consistent equation that relates the gap to the scattering potential, the gap at a, at, a, at a certain wave vector, to the scattering potential, and the gap at a different vector. And the BCS approximation is very simple. Okay, this thing here is constant and negative. It's attractive. This thing here is equal, it, it's equals to this one, and you have the standard BCS gap, the S wave gap. But if you assume that this is not a constant and not attractive, funny business happened, because you have a, a minus signal here. And this minus signal will make it so that if you have a scattering potential that connect very strongly two different portions of the Fermi surface which have a different sign in the gap, this scattering potential can be positive. You can have repulsive uh, uh, superconductivity. So this is maybe what happens. I, I, I say this is what happens in the cuprates, but I'm not going to enter in a, in a fight here, where you have the, the pi pi vector that connects very large regions, and you have the gap sign change, so you can have a no electronic mechanism for superconductivity just from a BCS light equation. Kay. In the nictites, the proposition is that the wave vector is not pi pi, but it's pi zero. It's related to the wave vector of the structural phase transition, the system, the spin density wave, and that would allow for a system that has an S plus minus pairing. Okay, so this would mean that you have different bands, so you have the electron-like and the hole-like, and one would have an S wave gap, and the other would also have an S wave gap, but with a pi phase difference. Okay, so it's just reversing the sign. How do we see that with optics? Okay, that, that's a very hard thing to measure, actually. Not with optics, optics with anything. Seeing this gap change as plus minus is not an easy thing, and there's no definite proof that you do see that, but you have indirect proofs that you can see this. So how does the infrared see the gap? So let me come back to the Druda model. This is niobium nitride, very conventional superconductor. It's strong coupled, but it's BCS. It works very nicely. Optical conductivity as a function of the energy here what you're seeing here, this curve here, is the Druda peak. So it's sort of this zero-centered peak. Okay. Who with the path maximum is the scattering rate. So what you would expect for a superconductor is that this scattering rate goes to zero. The lifetime between collisions are infinite. Electrons are not scattered anymore. 
So if you have that, you would have a delta function here and zero everywhere else. That's the perfect metal response. There's no AC conductivity, there's only DC conductivity. But the superconductor has a gap. And when light gives energy to the system, you break the Cooper pairs and the system comes back to normal. So this is uh, essentially what you have at this lower temperature here. You would have a delta function here. You would have zero all the way to the gap and then it goes back to the normal state. This is the standard uh, response of a superconductor, S-wave superconductor. And the peak you see in here is just thermally broken quasi-particles because you're not at zero Kelvin. Okay, so this, I'm depicting this like this. The D-wave for the cube rates would give you something that's not really universal. It depends a lot on the scattering rates, but what you would have is a normal state that looks like a Druda-like peak, so this zero frequency center peak, and at the superconducting state, you would lose some spectral weight here, the same way you lose here, but you do not necessarily you definitely do not go to a flat zero. You stay with a finite value. This eventually might reach zero at zero frequency, but you just lose the spectral weight. You could imagine this as a continuum of D wave of S wave gaps. So you would have a gap at zero, a gap at one millivolt, two millivolts, three millivolts, etc. Just add them. So one of the cases would just be a straight line going up here all the way. Okay. Now, uh, a few years ago, we had a very nice multiband superconductor, magnesium diboride, that now we can call after the nictides the S++. Peak, right? So if you call this S++, S wave everywhere in two bands, but the same uh, sign in all of them. And what you have here, this is a little bit more complicated to see. This is the optical conductivity divided by its value just above the critical temperature. So you take all these curves and divide by this one. So it's flat, the normal state, and it will just develop this drop here. Now what you can see is that if you look with the eyes of the faith and a little bit of goodwill, you see that it's very low here, almost zero. Then it goes up as it should, and then there's another kink here. At this, oh, sorry. What happened? You have seen all of this already, that's fine. Okay, so you have the second kink here at about 50 wave numbers or, or 8 millivolts. So this is one gap, this is another one. Just imagine two curves like that, one with the minimum here and one with the minimum here. Add the two, so you have one that does this and the other that does zero to here and a little bit more. Okay, so S plus P. And what happens with S plus minus? That we have harder time to understand. So that's what we're trying to understand here. And uh, when you look at two systems, two interesting systems here, one is the barium potassium ion arsenide. So you're putting potassium in the barium site. The other is the barium iron cobalt arsenide. So you're putting cobalt in the barium site. This is reflectivity as a function of frequency. And there is one thing that's present in both of them, okay, you have this drop here. I'm not going to discuss this. Very high reflectivity. It's a metal, so it's like a mirror. Okay, you have 92% reflectivity here at this very long distance. And it's a metallic sample. And below a certain temperature, it's a really good metallic sample. It's 100% reflectivity. This is what we expect for a very nice superconductor. So eventually, this is the same thing as the conductivity I'm going to show you later. Uh, this means Cooper pairs, perfect conduction, all the way to the gap, and then it drops. If you look at the cobalt sample, things are not so clear-cut, right? I don't see any flat region here. I could draw one here if I wanted, but it would be a little bit of a stretch. But I do see an increase in the reflectivity when I go into the superconducting state. So this has always to happen, but I don't see this flat response here. So this is the raw data. I just want to show you that the effects that I'm going to show are in the raw data somehow. Okay. So now I'm calculating the optical conductivity. And when you do that, this is the optical conductivity for barium potassium iron arsenide. It's a wonderful double S-wave superconductor. Okay, you have 4 Kelvin, TC is 39 for the sample. 
for Kelvin, you have zero within noise all the way to this value. Then it goes up. This small peak here is a phonon, and just above a phonon, if you could come here and look from this side I'm looking, you could see that it changed slopes. Okay? So you have another gap here. Infrared is not sensitive to the phase. So if it's S plus plus or S plus minus, it doesn't care. Like MGB2, you have something that's zero all the way to the first gap, the smallest one, goes up, and at the second gap, you add something else. And when you warm it up, you have the thermally broken quasiparticles. It's a wonderfully well-fitted system by a classical mechanism. If you look at the cobalt-doped sample, things are a mess. You see anything at all, as you see in the potassium-doped sample. And what you do see is, in the normal state, you have this orange curve here, which is sort of a drood like There's a small peak here that's up to debate. Some people claim it's uh, some weird collective modes. Some people say that it's just interband transitions that you have in the system. So let's forget it. It's totally temperature independent in the data. But when you go below 30 k, the TC for this sample is 25. You do lose spectral weight. You do lose carriers here because you have to build up the delta function. So you are going superconducting even in the conductivity. But you're not going to zero. You don't find this nice gap thing here. Okay? You're standing all the way up here. So, and most of all, you have this peak that remains here, this drew the like peak. So how can I interpret this? Okay, I can look at ARPIS and STM for the same set of samples, and you see something similar. Okay, so this is barium potassium arsenide, uh, um, and this is uh, STM, and you have a very nice, so this is the, the conductance as a function of the bias voltage. You have a very nice gap here in all the barium potassium arsenides. They claim they can fit this with two gaps, one smaller, one bigger. It fits with infrared, everything's fine. This is ARPIS compared to this. When you look at the uh, cobalt-doped sample, you have this V-shape. You don't have this nice gap here. So this is the same thing that infrared is looking at. Okay. So both infrared and transport and ARPIS are working together here. So if I go back to the infrared and put the two superconducting curves, barium potassium and barium cobalt arsenide on the same plot. This is the superconductivity of barium potassium, nice gap. This is barium cobalt, not nice gap. And what can be happening here? I mentioned that everything funny happens in the iron arsenide plans. When you put cobalt, you're putting impurities in the iron arsenide plans. Cobalt goes in the place of, of iron. And when you put potassium, it goes in the place of barium. So it planes doesn't care for them. You're putting scatters in the plane in one case and out of the plane in the other case. Now, look, if you have an S plus minus thing here, S plus minus gap, and you put scatters in the plane, you can scatter Cooper pair from here to there. They have opposite phases. They annihilate. One kills each other. So you kill superconductivity by non-magnetic impurity scattering in, in, in S plus minus uh, system. So in the cobalt, where you have impurity scattering in the plane, you see this very large residual quasi-particle through the like peak. In the potassium, where you don't have scatters in the plane, you don't see anything. So this is my claim of an indirect measurement of an S plus minus symmetry for this. But things are not that simple. Okay, because you're very happy, then you say, OK, potassium is fine. You always have a nice gap. No, you don't. Because you can go to the underdoped potassium. And now people say, oh, but it, when you're under doping, you're putting disorder. No, you're not. You're taking off disorder. The most doped potassium sample is the most disordered one. It's the one you put most potassium. It's the highest TC, 39 Kelvin. This is the reflectivity, 100% reflectivity. Then you have a small little, take a little bit of potassium off. You still have 100% reflectivity. Take more, 100% ah, is not so 100% anymore. And you take even more, then a whole bunch of things happen. So if you look at the conductivity, once again, high doping, very nice BCS-like gapped conductivity, gapped conductivity, and not so much gapped anymore. So are you breaking pairs here? Do you have impurity scattering here? And the answer is probably not, okay? because you have less impurities, and uh, you shouldn't be scattering. But the, the claim here, and this is a paper by a couple of years ago by my T and Shubukov group, that when you cross this point here, 
the separation within the superconducting dome uh, where the spin density wave phase would arrive, you change the gap symmetry. And they, their calculations, then it's up to the date, propose that you have a nodeless, then a nodo, and then a nodeless gap again. So what we think is that we are going through this phase transition. Okay, you're changing from this full gap, no nodes, perfect S wave gap, to a situation where the gap vanishes because of the coupling with the spin density wave model. Okay? So there is a competition in the systems. You can destroy conductivity by either doping in the plane or by just going into the magnetic phase. So you have competition because of scattering and competition because of, of magnetism. So just before I finish, I just would like to make, I'll reverse this too. Uh, there is a whole bunch of PhD available at the SPCI, so if there are candidates willing to go, there are 30 of them that have to be given on the next three years. Just go to this website or talk to you later. And just to finish my talk, uh, I try to show you four features of the physics in the nictides. First, that things are not what they seem if you consider multiband conductivities in the system. That you have maybe interesting Dirac physics, which is still very, uh, very incipient in the system. And that you have very interesting effects on the conducting gap, either by doping or by going into the magnetic phase. Thank you very much.